So speaking of Freedom, Freedom Fi, uh, next we have Boris Rinsky, the co-founder and CEO at Freedom Fi, the open 5G company on a mission of democratizing wireless connectivity. Prior to Freedom Fi, he spent 12 years of his career in the open source cloud infrastructure space as the co-founder and CMO at Mirantis and board member of the OpenStack Foundation. Joining Boris is Mark Phillips. Mark is the VP of Business Development at Helium. Mark and his team focus on expanding the footprint of the Helium blockchain and the wireless networks underpins. Please welcome Boris Rinsky and Mark Phillips. All right. Hey, Boris. Sound check. Hey. Okay. So first of all, um, I wanted to thank uh, Marielle. <laughs> now that we're going uh, um, immediately after her, actually the uh, first part of the presentation, um, I meant to actually tell a little bit about what we do, but um, I think she made my job quite easy and I don't have to spend too much time on it. Um, so moving on to the actual content, um, what we're going to be talking about is um, using Magma and Helium blockchain to build the world's first people's neutral host network. Um, I'll start with what we do. I think some of it has been already talked about. So most of the team on our side um, comes from the open source world and our competence really about taking open source projects and making them um, actually, you know, super easy to use for the masses. So our product really is um, um, an opinionated distribution of Magma that makes it super easy for anybody to uh, very quickly uh, bring up a small scale private cellular network. And the approach that we take is um, we don't actually make our own radio. Um, we um, rely on a whole bunch of partners uh, for radio. So you can go ahead and buy a radio of your own. There is a whole bunch of commodity small cells that are available on the market today that are fairly inexpensive. Um, then we ship um, a piece of hardware called the Freedom Fi Gateway into which you can plug in your radio. And after that, you uh, log into a, a SaaS hosted portal insert the list of your SIM cards and voila, you know, you have your network running. And um, as uh, I think uh, it's obvious, um, we heavily rely on Magma for pretty much everything that we do. The um, Freedom Fight Gateway on the inside is basically um, a hardened and pretested version of the uh, Magma Access Gateway. And our SaaS portal is um, based on uh, the Magma Orchestrator. So, and that's us. So I won't spend more time on us, um, and I'll hand off to uh, Mark to talk about Helium. Great, thanks, Boris. Uh, do you mind just driving the slides? I think that'll make it a little bit easier from, uh, yep. from my side. Cool. Um, so thank you very much to Kendall and Philip and the, the conference for having Boris and myself here to speak about uh, Freedom Fi and uh, Helium. Um, that talk that preceded us by Muriel was fantastic. And um, it, it leads, I mean, I'm not sure if this was by design, but it leads remarkably well into the sort of thing that Boris and I are gonna talk about. Um, and, uh, you know, I have not been in the Magma community for a long time, um, just like a handful of weeks. Uh, but what I can say is it seems uh, remarkably positive and uh, very, very sort of um, uh, fast moving and uh, very thrilled for Helium to be taking part in this. So um, most of you probably have not heard of Helium yet. So uh, uh, feel free, to drop questions, by the way, in the Slack channel or in chat. Um, we'll grab them afterwards. Uh, my name is Mark Phillips, as Boris mentioned. I run business development at Helium. I've been with the company for about seven years. Um, Helium builds people-powered networks. So we were founded about uh, seven years ago, I think exactly seven and a half years ago. Uh, and we, we've always been sort of in the business of making it easier to ship uh, connected services. So you know, we started with uh, Internet of Things devices or IoT devices, typically that are using um, you know, what's called an LP WAN network. That should be a term that most people here are familiar with. Um, and about three years ago, we sort of um, went back to the drawing board and said, how is it that we help our customers really build um, IoT devices on a network that sort of just exists? 
And so we integrated something called the Helium blockchain. Uh, so it's a brand new blockchain with a native token um, called HNT, which I'll talk about. Um, and you know, I don't have too long to sort of focus on Helium here because I want to make sure that the, the full talk gets talked about. Um, but, but the story behind the blockchain is that we sort of joked about it as an incentive mechanism um, to get people to start deploying um, what is a LoRaWAN network. And then after a handful of months of joking, we sat down and sort of wrote a design spec. You know, some people call these white papers. And you know, we kicked it around for a while, uh, had a bunch of whiskey and said, man, this is a pretty good idea. So we landed on something called the Helium blockchain. That was about three years ago. Um, we started shipping hardware into the field. And I'm gonna show some pictures of hardware in a second uh, about uh, less than two years ago. I mean, the first city that the Helium network sort of um, put LP WAN coverage into. So when I say Helium network, I mean Helium Inc and our community and partners was Austin, Texas. Uh, and then that was in uh, August of 2019. We didn't actually start shipping hardware en masse until uh, October 2019. And so since then, um, we've built what is the largest contiguous uh, LP WAN network, so LoRa WAN, um, in the world in just under 12 months, which is wild. Um, so we're in just about 3,000 cities at this point across 60 countries. Again, this is these are people, company, individuals running hardware on the Helium network providing LoRa WAN coverage. Um, there are 18,000 uh, gateway nodes out there right now. So I'll say gateway, I'll say hotspot, I'll say minor. These are all things um, providing Helium network coverage, LoRaWAN coverage across the world. Um, we think we'll see 150,000, probably more than that by the end of 2021, which is just absolutely bonkers. Um, what's really interesting is that we're sort of, uh, we're seeing this sort of progression in who's deploying on the Helium network. And I'm gonna sort of tie this into why we think working with FreedomFi is so promising. Um, uh, but what's really, oh, back a little bit for me, Boris, for one more second. Um, so so we've, we've basically built the largest uh, LP WAN network in the world with a community primarily, uh, and you know, this is more true early on than it is now, primarily who'd never heard of the wireless technology that we're using, right? So they know about Wi-Fi, they know about cellular. Most people have not heard of LP WAN, um, especially LoRaWAN, right? So we built the largest LoRaWAN network in the world with people who were who did not know what it was. Um, and so the incentive mechanism, right, the Helium blockchain and this token called HNT is really sort of what drove people to bring the network together. And, and the mechanism fundamentally uh, is something called proof of coverage. I'll talk about that in a second. So go ahead, Boris. Um, so when I talk about 18,000 miners on the network and 150,000 by the end of the year, um, I'm talking about things that look like this. So you've got the Helium hotspot and maybe might actually be some people at this conference that are running one um, or maybe running five. Uh, thank you for being part of the community. Um, and then in the back there, you've got models from companies like Nebra and Easy Lincoln and Rack. Um, these are ecosystem manufacturers that are manufacturing hardware um, that the Helium ecosystem has approved, right? And so, uh, you know, again, back to that 20, 18,000 number, um, there's 18,000 of these models out there. We think there'll be 150,000 plus of these plus some other ones on the network. Um, and this is fundamentally due to the incentive mechanism called proof of coverage. So I wanna go ahead, Boris. So proof of coverage is the idea that um, when you deploy on the Helium network and you're deploying something that's part of the Helium blockchain, um, you are earning HNT for providing coverage. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go too deep into the mechanism at, uh, on this talk, but there's if you go to docs.helium.com or explore.helium.com, we'll drop some of these links into the chat and into, um, into the Slack. Um, we have very good documentation on what this means, but suffice it to say, if you are running a gateway or a hotspot on the Helium network, uh, fundamentally what your gateway is doing is providing coverage for Helium's network users, right? So these are companies like um, Naui Sensors and Lime Scooters uh, and Victor Mousetraps who are sending IoT data over the LoRaWAN link back to their cloud-based applications. And so the network and the blockchain specifically will reward you uh, for providing coverage. And so there's sort of different layers of rewards, right? So if you're just um, issuing what we call a challenge, basically you know, sending a message to the network, prompting people to sort of prove their coverage, you get paid for that in HNT. Um, you get uh, compensated in HNT for being part of the consensus group, which is you know, securing and mining all the transactions. There's about five or six different layers. Um, but what's really sort of fascinating about this, and this is what sort of Helium designed, is that although we started with LoRaWAN, it can be applied to any connectivity layer, right? So 4G, uh, LTE, 5G, 3G, Wi-Fi, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, so if you go ahead, one more slide, Boris. I got two slides left here, I think, right? And I'll kick it back over to you. So uh, these are a few screenshots from mappers.helium.com. And, and again, we can share these links. So um, 
I think you can see this. So the city on the left is Chicago and the city on the right is Oakland, right? So uh, Chicago on the left and Oakland sort of um, East Bay as they call it on the right. And this is a, uh, a picture showing actual mapped helium network LoRaWAN coverage in these cities. And so um, these are uh, location sensors with uh, GPS modules attached to them, sending data through the helium network. Um, if you go to mappers.helium.com, you can see what the, the sort of legend means, but um, different colors represent different RSSI um, on, the, on the network. But this is, this is ridiculous, right? These are, these are people who are deploying helium hotspots uh, incentivized by HNT and the helium blockchain providing unbelievable coverage. We're talking like cellular level coverage for devices and sensors in these cities. And these aren't the only two. Um, there are probably you know 50 cities in the world that have this level of coverage, but we're expanding you know, at a wild clip. Uh, and so we're really starting to see actual resilient telco grade LP WAN coverage built by individuals and companies that are on the network. Uh, and so just want to bump it one more and I'll, I'll wrap this up and kick it back to you. So what we're seeing is um, early days, people involved in the Helium network were sort of hobbyists, bleeding edge sort of crypto enthusiasts. Um, it's very easy to uh, put uh, a gateway on the on the Helium network. So the, the cost is remarkably low, it's like, you know, 300 US dollars, 400 US dollars and decreasing um, very quickly. So people started to deploy 10 of these, right? 15, 20. And so now, um, to sort of tie us back into the the sort of the Freedom Five stuff here and you know 4G 5G, um, we're seeing people sort of embrace this at a, a telco grade level, like repurposing tower assets and putting up what are just remarkably good uh, coverage locations. So forgetting the cities where these are, I think the one on the right is from the East Bay. Uh, it's a guy named Joey who's part of the network. Uh, lower left I think is in the Los Angeles area, and then I think the top two are somewhere in the Midwest. Um, but you know, the, the, the thing to take away here is that the, the blockchain, the Helium blockchain has incentivized people to build remarkably good wireless coverage. And we started with LoRaWAN and in working with FreedomFi, um, actually this is the first time anyone <laughs> has found out about this. So uh, uh, excited to sort of be talking about it. Um, we think we can build fantastic you know, uh, 5G coverage working with FreedomFi and the Magma community. So I'll kick it back to you, Boris, but um, thank you. Yep, thanks, Mark. So um, you've heard a little bit about Freedom Fi and you've heard a little bit about Helium. And I think uh, this picture illustrates somewhat um, the concept that we can get to uh, by combining uh, the two efforts. Now, at Freedom Fi in general, we are you know, always excited about open source, um, not just because you know, it's a permissive licensing model and it makes things super cost efficient, but because it's actually a completely new way to spearhead bottoms up innovation. And sometimes this innovation and experimentation leads to a very disruptive outcomes. The reason why we are particularly excited about our work with uh, uh, the Helium team is because we genuinely feel that um, you know, this is the, the, the whole the whole decentralized wireless movement um, could result in a completely new way of uh, building wireless networks. If you think about Linux and how it started, um, you know, the near term motivation of building Linux was to basically produce a cost efficient version of uh, Unix. But in the end, it became the engine that fueled the uh, growth of the Internet. And I think that. Uh, here with Magma, um, you know, the original motivation may be to make it inexpensive to uh, connect the unconnected by decreasing the uh, cost of uh, wireless cores. But ultimately, I think there is an opportunity uh, for projects like Magma combined with the initiatives like Helium to actually completely disrupt the uh, face of the cellular wireless industry. So needless to say, um, you know, when we're talking about smart contracts and blockchain, there's probably a, not a single um, industry out there that there wasn't a, a blockchain decentralized project that came out and said that we're going to disrupt it. Yet the uh, examples of that are not that many. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the near term practical use cases that we're going after with uh, our collaboration. And um, it's not the use case that 
maybe immediately comes top of mind where, you know, sell a whole bunch of uh, peanut bees and everybody starts mining and all of that is connected into this mega global network and we kill AT&T and Verizon. So obviously that's that's not going to happen. But I think that there is a whole bunch of um, immediately practical applications for this combination um, that could bring a lot of value to the industry. So the first one, and uh, it's interesting that we've actually already had um, a gentleman from Washington University to talk about it a little bit, um, is um, LTE or flow to CBRS. So um, we actually are currently working um, with a couple of uh, MNOs and MVNOs to uh, implement this into reality. And this is really what we're focusing on near term. And uh, I'll talk quickly about what it looks like from the end user standpoint, and um, as well as from the uh, architecture implementation standpoint. So from the end user standpoint, imagine this picture. You get um, a CBRS private LTE kit, which is something that we at Freedom Fi have uh, recently launched um, and has been quite popular, which, by the way, altogether costs less than an ASIC-based Bitcoin miner today. So this entire box of stuff, thanks to the commoditization and open source, is now less expensive than a Bitcoin miner. You go and you set up your Freedom Fi um, network following the quick start instructions, which are publicly available already. And we've set up now probably close to 100 of these networks, ranging from one to, you know, 50 um, e -not Bs. Um, and it's very quickly and it's super cost efficient and it's super fast. Um, lower WAN connectivity um, is still used um, for actually informing the network about the uh, status of uh, any particular CBSD, uh, whether or not the uh, you know, backhaul is available, how reliable the coverage of that specific uh, node is. And um, this way the network has kind of the aggregate picture of the reliability of each individual node in the network. Um, and that data can be synced through the existing kind of a LoRaWAN model that uh, Helium provides. And uh, the people operating each node um, earn um, rewards in the form of uh, HMT for A, providing coverage using the proof of coverage model, as well as for passing the data um, through the network. And then finally, um, the uh, MNO or MVNO is actually able to uh, roam traffic into that network. And in addition to the MNO and MVNO traffic roaming into that network, um, a person can actually go ahead and use that network themselves. So if it's, a, for example, like a private LTE campus network or it's a university, or if it's a, just you know, a couple of guys with a farm um, whom we have you know, plenty of examples of, they can use that same exact network for their own use case, but enable third parties to actually roam into it as well. So now a little bit about uh, the high level uh, architecture um, of how that use case works. So um, with Magma 1.5, there is uh, two important features that are coming out that are in the works now. That I think that will be talked about when we talk roadmap. Um, one is the uh, S8 inbound roaming. Um, and uh, two is uh, dual PLMN support so that you can have a network uh, on one PLMN that is your private LTE network. Um, and the second is going to be a separate PLMN coming from the uh, MNO or MVNO. And um, again, I won't go super deep into the Magma architecture details. This is the standard Magma architecture here. The uh, um, basically Magma AGW connected to the CBSDs. Magma Orchestrator somewhere hosted in the cloud. You have a single VPN link to connect to VHSS or VMNO. And then for a common inbound roaming scenario where you actually unfortunately do still in most cases have to ship traffic based on the centralized core of VMNO, you have a link back to the uh, e gateway um, on the MNO side. So the next use case, and this is something that's uh, on the roadmap that is also um, largely supported by Magma out of the box today, but is not something that we are rolling out just immediately now, is the carrier Wi-Fi. So in fact, the very first project that we ever did with Magma was um, 
carrier Wi-Fi offload. So when you you are an MNO, you have you know your congested LTE spectrum, and you want to offload into the local Wi-Fi access points um, operated by some third party. Um, you can use a component called Carrier Wi-Fi Access Gateway. So the architecture here would be basically running that CWAG plus the HNT miner um, on the uh, Freedom Fi Gateway, and the rest of the architecture is largely very similar. Now, one thing I want to underline is that you know this is an existing and up-and-coming thing. There are companies like, uh, for example, there's this project Google Orion, uh, which uh, enables you know any small business get you know a bunch of Wi-Fi routers, and then Google Fi will offload their MVNO traffic into that Wi-Fi. Now, I think that the difference here is, uh, in my personal view. Um, the model of you know hey deploy a wi-fi router in your starbucks and get paid five dollars a month for google or at&t to offload the traffic there is generally utterly uninspiring because you get some money but you don't really get to participate in the bigger reward of actually building that decentralized network and the helium concept and the blockchain concept is actually where individual node participants are actually part of the bigger ecosystem where as this ecosystem grows and the value that it brings to you know the bigger wireless world grows with it um you get rewarded for it it's like much like buying a stock in the company and that model is much more inspiring and i bet you that is why um helium was able to deploy 17,000 plus nodes in 12 months um if Helium model was, you know, buy a LoRaWAN um, device and, you know, we'll pay you $5 a month indefinitely, I doubt the success would be the same. And then finally, um, and I think that some people have talked about this as well, um, and this is a concept that is present in the world as well, um, less the blockchain piece, and this is uh, the people's fixed wireless access network concept. So there are, you know, just completely altruistic versions of it, such as GUIFI.net um, or some of the, you know, other ones that smaller scale, I think, exist in the U.S. But generally, it's a point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint Wi-Fi based network for fixed wireless access, where owners of, uh, you know, certain real estate with access to, you know, wholesale bandwidth can broadcast that bandwidth through point-to-multipoint Wi-Fi uh, to other people to catch it. And then there's those that spread it out, and there's those that basically play a role of a relay, and everybody, you know, gets compensated for their role. So today these things exist, but they are, you know, there is no compensation attached to, you know, the participants, or, you know, in some instances where we have done deployments of fixed wireless access, I just know that uh, the, you know, the wisps that we work with, they would put the, uh, you know, the ubiquity access points onto the silo and would give a guy free internet um, and, and that's the extent of sophistication of rewards distribution through that network i think that this can be changed dramatically by actually um, applying the uh, um, blockchain based distribution of rewards um, into the system so now really quickly about actually the architecture um, for that first um, um, deployment use case that we're talking about which is a uh, um, LTE to uh, CBRS offload. So um, there's some easy stuff that uh, we have been working on and we've done already, and there's some not so easy stuff. So the easy stuff is uh, basically taking um, the you know existing Freedom Fight gateway and running the uh, Helium Miner software on it, plus adding um, a LoRa radio into the Freedom Fight gateway. So we actually have a prototype of that and it's already done and we've tested it and it's working. Now, the slightly harder stuff is um, um, finding the right way to integrate the Helium blockchain with, um, so to speak, the uh, you know LTE accounting ecosystem. And um, in doing that, we... Uh, try to lean on kind of a two um, um, concepts. One is uh, um, we try to uh, reuse as much of uh, what's already present, um, you know, within the uh, um, 
LTE architecture ecosystem as well as the uh, Helium blockchain ecosystem without needing to change dramatically the sets of interfaces that, that each one is used to. And at the same time, also do it such that uh, it's forward looking because as you know, um, right now we're kind of on a paradigm of LTE moving to 5G. Um, most of the uh, AAA in LTE happens using diameter um with you know 5g all of that's going away and we're going to the more like typical you know distributed systems internet http type of approach so um to kind of uh, explain this in more detail um i couldn't find a way but you know flash this completely nerd slide but i think that if i you know just walk you through really quickly as an example it'll become clear. So on this slide, um, what we've done is we've basically shown the exact workflow um, of uh, interaction between all of the entities, UE, Node B, EPC, Miner, et cetera, for the uh, um, initial um, UE attach and session initiation flow. And the stuff that is uh, marked in uh, black is uh, basically traditional um, LTE and diameter kind of calls. The stuff that is uh, marked in red um, is um, just you know standard HTTP type communication that happens sometimes inside of the Helium blockchain, sometimes it happens between the OCS and the miner itself. So the attach process looks like follows. Um, you know, we send the uh, attach request, the UE sends the attach request to, uh, you know, E not B, passes on the EMZ to uh, the EPC, and then this whole thing goes to uh, OCS. And we have this CCRI call into the OCS, which is the standard diameter stuff. Um, now, OCS um, basically, you know, sends now an HTTP based request over to the miner um, with a request to, uh, you know, initiate the LTE session. And um, at this point, um, the miner creates basically, you know, sends, sends a request to the blockchain and creates the session and then creates what's uh, in blockchain referred to as a state channel. So um, there's a couple of uh, concepts that blockchains use and that Helium uses specifically that are very alien to the uh, LTE world. One is uh, this concept of a state channel. Um, and uh, the other is um, more of like a LoRaWAN specific concept, which is uh, the way to uh, identify the devices on the uh, LoRaWAN network using dev adder, which is a unique identifier for each device. So um, we go through back and forth between uh, the miner um, and blockchain. We create the state channel and the state channel is basically uh, this off chain, as they call it, um, medium for which we can pass the packets um, and um, once this whole process is finally concluded um, what we need to do is we need to you know basically following again um, standard diameter calls grant quota and the quota gets granted by the OCS and that communication goes through diameter through the federation gateway and back out to the UE and you have a kind of a, the session initiated. So the point of this flow is that we've tried to change virtually nothing about the uh, way that the Helium blockchain operates in that we use their existing concept of dev adder, only we use dev adder for identifying an LTE session rather than a lower win session. And uh, at the same time, um, on the LTE side, um, we're actually using, you know, diameter calls um, such that, uh, you know, the LTE world can understand how the accounting can be processed. So um, quickly about the roadmap, um, the, you know, running of the gateway, um, minor on the gateway, that part is done. Um, right now we're working hard at uh, this, this implementation of the minor to the OCS or CHF in case of 5G implementation. Um, and another thing that we haven't talked about here, but uh, we're also working on updating the Helium blockchain itself to accommodate for the high throughput data types, um, such as, you know, LoRaWAN is very low data rate. 
Um, and then in April, we are targeting to actually start doing pilot deployments. So we are, you know, super excited about this. We want everybody to uh, kind of join in and participate in this. So please, um, if you are interested, um, email us at helium at freedomfy.com. And, um, you know, if you're an MNO or on VNO and you want to pilot this, if you want to be, you know, if you own farmland or skyscraper and you want to deploy some nodes initially, or if you just want to contribute code and stay appraised, email us there and, you know, we can do a separate Q&A session about it. And that's all I had. Thank you. Hey, Boris. Hey, Mark. Thanks so very much. I think that that was a fascinating presentation and the idea of uh, self-supporting deployments through blockchain is just an amazing concept. So Mark, you've, you've hit what seems to be a winner here with, with that idea. Uh, we are a couple minutes over your time, but I do, because of the nature of your talk, want to at least take one or two questions off the bridge. So if anyone has anything for Quick Mark question, or Boris. Prakash here. Do we have to have LoRa uh, presence in place where we want to implement this Freedom Fi? There is Freedom Fi. No. Okay. Thanks. You Thanks. do not. Okay. Couple more. Hey, Boris. Uh, how fast are the transactions? Yeah, so we don't have the uh, measurement yet for that. S stay tuned until we'll we'll have the data probably up in the next two weeks. By transactions, you mean like the attached transaction or the yes. just the throughput? I mean the, the attached, yeah, so basically. That, you know. yeah. yeah, yeah. So I I don't have the you know, I don't have the specific data on it just yet. But All our right. goal is to make it you know comparable to what you would experience with a typical you know, attach procedure in, in LTE. All right, definitely I will be tuning in. Okay, James. Hi, um, I'm wondering, do you use smart contracts or is that all? I mean, basically how do you handle the, is it, is it just basically people can show up or, or they don't have to have any sort of prearranged agreement or what actually, how does that work? Yeah, the you... idea for this. Go ahead, Boris. I... Yeah, so I mean, from the standpoint of the user experience, the idea is to make it just as seamless as it is uh, on, uh, you know, Helium blockchain today with LoRaWAN. Um, you know, we ship you a node, you stand it up, and that's it. And after that, magic happens. Um, we take care of everything on the back end, including the uh, Spectrum Access grants from SaaS and the, you know, roaming contracts from MNOs, etc. Um, it's a question is more around like the logic of how the blockchain itself works, then probably that's more to mark. Yeah, so just generally the Helium blockchain uh, it does not use any sort of smart contract. There's no real concept of a smart contract. Um, and you know, for the use case that we have, uh, uh, there's no real need for it at this point. Um, we've certainly explored it, but at this point there's nothing built in. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 